Simon Ateba is the chief White House correspondent for Today News Africa, and you may recognize him from the long-standing feud he's been in with White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre for asking the questions reporters are supposed to ask. Her response has been hostile from ignoring Simon outright to publicly scolding him for asking questions. Now, he's accusing the White House of discriminating against him, and now he says the White House is revising its press pass policy, which takes effect in July, to deny him access. He's here with us now to discuss the recent tussle with the White House press office. Uh, Simon, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Thank you for having me. So first of all, let's talk about the discrimination that you feel like you're experiencing there in the press room. What is the new, um, well, how have they treated you prior to this new change in policy? And we'll get to that. But what is your, what's been your experience while you've been in that press room? So um, let me just give you an example. In December 2022, President Biden hosted the second U.S. Africa Leaders Summit in Washington, D.C. There were 50 African leaders who traveled from the continent of Africa to Washington, D.C. to sit down with one president. For those who are watching us, Africa has between 54 and 55 countries, depending on who you ask, the U.N. or the African Union. For 50 African leaders to travel to Washington, D.C. means almost all the presidents in Africa came to Washington, D.C. to meet with President Biden. Yet, the African in the briefing room, who has been focusing on ties and interaction between U.S. and Africa, wasn't given the opportunity by the press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, to ask a question. Uh, she treated me in a disrespectful way, um, and it, the treatment has been very bad. She's discriminated against me and sidelined me. Uh, this year, because they couldn't kick me out of the uh, the White House Correspondents Association, what they did was they waited for me to renew my membership and they didn't approve it. They didn't give any valid reasons. And because they didn't approve it, when President Biden attended the White House Correspondents Dinner in April last month, just last month, they didn't allow me to buy a ticket, even though there were 7,000 plus tickets that were sold. And the White House briefing room has only 49 seats plus a few people who stand. As someone who has been in the White House, covering the White House for several years, who attended all the press briefings in 2022, did countless stories. For me not to be allowed to buy a ticket to attend the White House Correspondents' Dinner, when they invited spies and all kinds of lobbyists and people who hate the U.S. were at that party with Biden and Harris. You know, it was heartbreaking. But the most important thing is she doesn't respect the First Amendment, which uh, protects the freedom of speech, freedom of the press, association, and even the right to petition your government to seek redress. And it's been heartbreaking. It's been very disrespectful, scolding me. And I've seen even a few other journalists who are covering the White House then against me, trying to you know attack me because when you come to Washington D.C., you come here to change things. But as you come here and life becomes really beautiful, you do yoga, you go to the gym, you fly on Air Force One with the president, you become so comfortable that you forget that your job is to hold those in power accountable, not to become friendly with them. And unfortunately, most people have become friendly with the people in power and they don't they no longer challenge them. Yeah, I definitely uh, I, I think that we all suspect that now those of us that are outside of the Beltway for sure suspect that it is just a swamp there. And there does seem to be a very cozy relationship between the press and the politicians. And it's not supposed to be that way. The press is supposed to be holding their feet to the fire, asking them uh, challenging questions. And we don't see that at all. I mean, what we see, you know, those of us sitting on the other side of the country just see a lot of the press asking the same questions over and over. They don't ask for any elaboration on those questions. Then they switch over to what's Biden's favorite ice cream flavor. I mean, it's just yeah. really bizarre. So kind of walk us through this because a lot of us don't understand it. Um, how long have you been covering the White House? So you go into what is it? it's called the White House Correspondent Room is what's it That's called? Just, what's that room called? 
So you have been, the, the White House issues what is called the hard pass. Okay. They allow you to cover the White House. And the main requirement is you have to be a journalist and you need to do only one job, journalism. You can be a business guy and then come to the White House. But you go through the Secret Service uh, screening, you go, you do that. I've been there for a few years. I, I was there during Trump on and off. And when President Biden came to power, I felt like the good guy had come to power. This was a guy who was there for the black people and the immigrants and the little guy. And, you know, he had this beautiful message. The bad guy was in power and he was the one who was going to restore dignity, decency and a free press in the country. And so I decided to go and help the good guy, you know, uh, do really great. And then in November 2021, South Africa was able to identify the Omicron variant and alerted the WHO that there was a new variant. Actually, the variant was already in the U.S. and no one knew, even though the U.S. is supposed to be the most advanced country in the world with the, you know, the best scientists and the best people we didn't know. So the, the South Africa informed the WHO that they, they identified a new variant of, uh, of COVID-19 called the Omicron variant. How did the and the WHO inform the Biden administration? How did the Biden administration react? They reacted by banning eight African nations, including six of them who had zero cases of the variant. And just let's take a step back. Imagine President Trump banning eight black African nation, six of them with zero cases of the variant, when the variant was already in the UK, in Hong Kong, in the US, and they didn't ban any of them. When then Press Secretary Jen Psaki came to the briefing room, she read false figures. And I challenged her because a few hours before she came to the briefing room, I had just attended a press briefing with the WHO where they gave us the latest figures. And she came to the briefing room. She tried to exaggerate the number of cases in South Africa to justify why they banned those African nations. And since then, they became very disrespectful toward me, even antagonistic. Before then, they used to introduce me in their press office as our friend Simon has come, give him a seat. Because the first question I asked Jen Saki was a good question. I asked him, I asked her if those who, um, branded President Biden Sleepy Joe should be, you know, should apologize because he seemed to be doing his job. That was at the beginning of his administration. And they liked it. And, you know, I became the darling of the press room. But when I saw something that was wrong and I challenged them, she became disrespectful toward me. And then I went to her office to try to have a conversation with her. And she was very disrespectful. And she sent me an email to apologize. But by that time, I went on Tucker Carlson's show and I became their enemy. Yeah, that's uh, so. So prior to that point, so you're telling us that you um, I don't as a, as a journalist, do you do you feel like you take a side? I mean, it sounds to me like you almost didn't like Trump, but then you liked Joe Biden. So you had that. Bi I mean, a lot. I think most journalists, we have a bias, but we declare our bias or we say, well, this is my bias, but I'm still trying to report things fairly. Do you feel like you have a bias or did you have a bias? At no, that I, I, I did not. Like, so I, I was re reading the New York Times and watching CNN and, you know, all of them kept saying the same thing. Trump is the racist and everyone should resist Trump. Trump hates black. Trump hates foreigners. And as someone who was born in Africa, I believe that it was my duty to you know, not endorse, actually we didn't endorse Trump, our publication Today News Africa endorsed Biden because Biden was the good guy who was going to end right. racism. Okay. So that was based okay. on that. And so when I okay. found myself in the Biden White House, I then realized, I began to face even more discrimination. And I began to realize that there was little access to the press, to, to Biden's event than under Trump. President Trump used to have this big event and President Biden has not even come to the briefing room even once since he was, uh, uh, since he became president yeah. on January 20, 2021.
Let's talk about that. So Trump, he would c- go to the briefing room. How often would you say Trump was in the briefing room compared to Joe Biden? He's not just coming to the briefing room. When Trump did event, most people were allowed to attend. All you needed to do is to feel, you know, if you come from outside, you attend the briefing. Right now, you can't even attend the event. On Monday this week, the New York Post journalist was not allowed to attend uh, President Biden's event on Monday, even though there were 20 empty seats in, in, in the room. So he, President Trump came to the briefing room many times. President Biden has not come to the White House briefing room even once in two and a half years. So that's, wow. that's when even once he's not been there. And President Trump's event were open event most journalists were allowed to attend those events. And President Biden's event, even when they are empty seat, he doesn't allow, his press office doesn't allow some people to attend those events. And it's not just that. Most people have to send topics of discussions in advance. They call them topics that turn, that become questions. And when you don't send your questions in advance, what happens is the White House gives a list to President Biden to call on people who cover the White House. So when President Biden comes for you know, his event, he tells you, I have seven people. I was told I should call on seven people and each of them is to ask me one question. And that's what happened recently where, you know, we could see that he had a question in advance from someone from LA Times. LA Times. Yeah. So um, you you get in there and you just start to see. You had a bit of a bite, you know, thinking, okay, Bi- Biden's the good guy. You get in there, but you start to see that they're not reporting things accurately. So you start to challenge this. Did you find that the Trump White House was also not reporting things accurately? Did you challenge them as well? Yeah. So. Um, during President Trump, I attended many events that had to do with Africa. So if President okay. Trump is receiving the Nigerian president, for instance, uh, in the White House, and I will be in the White House to attend those events. Um, and, and during President Biden, we decided to have someone there 24-7 because the good guy was coming to power and we needed oh, to I see. be there. Okay. And, so you weren't you weren't always in the room when it was Trump, but now you're always in the room for Biden. So your experience mostly is with Biden. And yeah. but what you're experiencing is when you ask them questions now, they're shutting you down because they realize, wait a minute, you're not friendly. You're you're gonna actually ask us some real questions. So what yes. are some of the questions that you've been wanting to ask that they won't let you ask? Uh, different questions. For instance, if the vice president who just returned from Africa is going to the African continent and you have an African journalist in the White House, it makes right. sense for you to give a question to that African journalist who are in the White House. If the first lady is going to Africa, she just returned from Africa, it makes sense for you to call on the African journalist who is covering the White House. And if there are issues in Africa, for instance, in October 29, the U.S. intelligence agencies informed the U.S. embassy in Nigeria and the U.S. embassy in South Africa that there was going to be a bomb attack from a terrorist organization. Instead, on that day, the bomb attack took place 3,000 miles away in Mogadishu, Somalia, killing 100 people and injuring more than 300 others. Did anyone take responsibility for that false information No one took responsibility. The biggest crisis in the world between 2020, 2021, and 2022 wasn't in Ukraine. It was in Ethiopia, Tigris region, where US officials say up to 600,000 people were killed. And it wasn't receiving the attention that it should have received. Instead, the international community was focusing on the war in Ukraine that was less severe that kill less people. And you know, those are the things that uh, I, I won't focus on. It, it varies, right? Like if the president is receiving African leaders in Washington, DC, you won't ask him about the relationship between him and those leaders going into specific countries. But when you can't do that, 
in the White House. And you can do that even in background call with the national, the White House National Security Council. Then you realize there's a big problem. It's a disrespect, yeah. uh, total disrespect for the first, the first amendment. So they're now changing the rules. And they have now uh, made it to where, so have you applied for, uh, so how does this work? Like I said, you know, I'm not in, I'm not in that world on the beltway, so I don't know. So you have to apply to be there every day to be one of the like 50 some odd journalists no, daily. No. So the White House, once you go through the secret service and, you know, field forms, the White House gives you what is called the hard pass a few people have the hard pass. And so that hard pass allows you to go in and out freely, go into the White House anytime you want. And so- How many now people would you say have a hard pass? Sorry. So hundreds of people have the hard pass. For instance, okay. the big networks have like up to 10 people in the, in CNN we have like 10 people, Fox News we have like 10 uh, journalists. Uh, MSNBC, we have like 10 because they change people and then you have the cameramen and different, different people. Um, okay. But now the main difference is you need to have a, an approval from press galleries in the Supreme Court, the Senate, or the House of Representatives. And those ones, it, can, it may take between six months and a year for them to give approval for new applicants. So even when I apply on Friday or next next Monday, the earliest date for me to get approval from them may be six months or to a year from now. And if I don't have okay. that approval, I can I can apply I cannot apply for a credential in the White House. So you've uh, so they they're now changing it to where at the end of July your press pass your hard pass expires is that right or did it already expire? Yes, no, the hard pass will, will expire on July thirty first. And uh, have you applied for a new one? No, I, I no, I've not because uh, on Monday I'll be applying to have a credential in the press galleries either in the Supreme Court the Senate or the House of Representatives. So you're cha- you're switching. You're not going to be no. covering the White House anymore. No, no. So the White House wants you to have a credential from the Supreme from a press gallery in the Supreme Court or the Senate. Oh, I before see. you can apply before you can apply for a hard pass. <laughs> and, and that is that a change? That that part's a change? Yes, that's a big change because okay. it, take, it may take up to a year for you to for them to consider your application. And so should we, should to one of those it? other press galleries. And so these yeah. other big news outlets like New York Times and CNN, they already have those passes. They already have those ones because their focus is bigger than what we focus on. Today, news right, they're Africa. a bigger organization. Yeah, today, so, today New Africa focuses on so, ties and interaction between the U.S. and Africa. Yeah, so this one would this new rule change um, wouldn't just affect you. It actually affects any smaller news organization that maybe doesn't have the press passes to these other press galleries. And exactly. the White House is saying you have to have one of those, and then you can get one of ours. But you can't get one of ours until you get one of those. That doesn't even make sense. Why? Yes, so, and- so have they ever done anything like that before? No, I, I mean, uh, to my knowledge, no. Um, this is the first. That's what they're adding it. And I've already I talked to, I went to the White House briefing room today, and I've already spoken with some people who are unable to have it because some news organizations rely, rely on donation, donations to function. They are non-profit news organization. They don't allow people who make money through donations. They want- uh, What? Yes, the, the, for instance, in the House of Representatives, what they told one of my colleagues, was their publication is making money through donation is a non-profit organization and they need for profit organization so you need to uh, yes <laughs> but i mean that seems like that would actually disqualify uh organizations NPR. like npr right yeah. <laughs> right yeah, exactly. so yeah. is is npr now disqualified because of this rule change are they no, mad actually the npr journalists in the briefing room Tamara Kidd, she's the 
president of the White House Correspondents Association, uh, which is crazy, um, to say the least. So uh, what, she gets an exemption? I, I don't know. She's, you know, she's the president of the White House Correspondents Association. The rules, the new rules are there to target me. If you op- if you read the, the New York Post, the Washington Post, the Daily Caller, the Daily Beast, and several other publications, what they said is they are targeting Simon Atiba. They are trying to get rid of me. They are trying, they are targeting me. They don't want me to go to the White House only because I'm doing my job, asking the tough questions. My job is not to become friendly with the people in power. My job is just to ask questions. Um, And you may not like my questions. You may not like uh, my accent or you may not like me, but it's about the job. We need to do the job. We need to ask questions. We don't need to become very comfortable with the people, very friendly with the people in power. Now, Politico wrote um, a piece and says, Simon says and says and says and says, Have you, are you familiar with this one? Um, and they, they put this out in December of 2022, and they basically just accuse you of being disruptive. They say that it's not just the questioning, but that it's that you will shout out questions in the room um, or you will, you know, at, I, yeah, I guess ask questions without being called on, shout out more questions, be disruptive in general. That's what they're accusing you of. Okay, that was, what do you the, have to say about that? That was the worst piece. It was very um, dishonest of them. They, first of all, they added things that didn't hurt them. I called them out on Twitter. They didn't respond. Um, I don't respect Politico anymore. They are not a credible news organization. They lie against people. I'm not disruptive. I'm trying to do my job and I take seven months. I will go, let me give you an example. I don't leave my house for the briefing room to yell questions. I do my job every single day and I go to the press secretary office. I try to meet with her. I try to meet with her colleagues. I send them email. I log on to background press call, uh, background calls. They don't call on me. They don't respond to my email. They block me. They shut doors on me when I go to their office. They disrespect me. Actually, that disrespect is not just me. It's the disrespect towards the African continent. And after seven months, when I've exhausted all the avenues, I yell a question. And then they become uncomfortable. Because as I sit there in the briefing room every single day, I see all of them, they become entitled. Because, you know, as you keep receiving questions every single day, they begin to believe that, you know, they are better than people, that they are receiving questions because they work for better media organization. And they don't look behind them. It doesn't occur to them that there are people in that briefing room who have been coming there every single day for seven months and they've not been called on. And that while they receive five questions at at each press briefing, there are people behind them who also have questions and who are trying to do their job who don't get those questions. That level of entitlement is what makes people to hate them. When they lose their job, they realize that no one is there for them. And that's why people don't connect with them on Twitter. If you go and check all of them, when they tweet something, no one engage because they're not engaging with the people. They, they, they betray the trust of the people and they are now friendly with the people in government, sending questions in advance and doing an awful job. There was a guy from writer, Reuters who attacked me, awful. He does an awful job. Another guy from Salon who was kicked out from the briefing room doing Trump administration, you know, and even he was sacked during the first Bush administration, who was also pretending to, you know, lecture me. It's a shame that journalists have failed to do their job. They don't ask the right questions anymore. They are friendly with the people in power. And now they are tagging someone who is trying to do their job. And when you don't, when you don't toe the line, what they do is they call Politico, they call the Daily Beast. That's what they do, those two public three publications, they call Politico, they call the Daily Beast or Mediate, 
and the slam the the defame you it's a shame they should be ashamed of themselves i have no respect for the daily beast i have no respect for political and i have no respect for media anymore because they lied against me they treated me very badly instead of focusing on someone who is trying to do their job and calling out discrimination against them they decided to connive with the people in power to actually um, attack someone, their colleague. I'm with you on that. You know, Simon, I've been, uh, I have had a couple hit pieces written about me as well in the Daily Beast, and I couldn't agree more with you on that. They, and, and for what? For actually telling the truth in my job, you know, for actually being at a news organization and giving the facts, and then they called me names for that. So I, I feel you on that. That is, it's unfortunate, you're right, that journalism has gotten to this point that when they're attacking each other in this way where, and in a, in a real partisan way and in a way that, you know, it's one thing if you're gonna call out somebody who is not doing their job or there's corruption there or something along those lines, but to attack people for actually doing the job that they should be doing like you've been doing. Um, yeah, the, the, things, this is why there's, there's very little trust in media now, there's very little trust in the news and it's because of these types of things. So um, where they're calling you disruptive, but really you're just trying to get questions in, fair enough, right? The questions that the American people wanna know or even the African people wanna know and yeah. not getting those answers. I think that is, um, yeah, Simon, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing with us and hopefully you'll get the press pass. I mean, we'll stay in touch with you and find out what the latest is on that, but. Yes, maybe the last thing, if I can say one last thing, is sure. that's, that's why if you go to the New York Times Twitter page, they don't have any engagement. If you go to all their Twitter page, they have two likes and they have two comments because they've abandoned the people, they've betrayed the people and the people have turned their back on them. And now they are left to attacking people like me and no one respect them anymore. No one trusts them. And do we continue to go down? This year in the White House, several journalists have lost their jobs because their media organizations have shut down and it will continue. When people lose trust in you, they don't buy anymore, they don't place, they don't read you anymore and you can attract advertisement. Thank yeah. you for having me. Thank you for being on, Simon. Best of luck to you. Thank you.